how's it going YouTube it's time for another topic review uh, if you're new to the channel new to the playlist uh, my name is Seth Abney and I am a student currently at the coding boot camp called the Flatiron School and I'm enrolled in their data science program uh, there's five phases in the boot camp I am currently on the tail end of phase three and for this phase as a matter of um, just in enriching my study process and you know retaining a little bit more of what I learned um, I'm doing the study vlog where I review what I learned at the end of every module in phase three there's like 11 10 12 modules something like that I just finished the very last module of the phase so uh, after this module uh, the next step for me is to come up with what my milestone project will be and submit a proposal for that uh, I'm not going to share any more details about that right now because I'll probably make a video about it um, I, after this one directly so on uh, module 31 let's get into it uh, oh and before we do again disclaimer uh, I'm not doing this on behalf of Flatiron this is purely for my own enrichment and your entertainment uh, there's a little bit of sometimes I use code snippets I don't think I have any code snippets in this notebook but there's some like images and things like that that are from the curriculum of Flatiron all credit goes to them if you want to check out Flatiron what it uh, can offer you that link will be in the description below as well as my github and my LinkedIn and all that good stuff so now let's get into the notebook so we're in module 31 uh, today we're going to talk about ensemble modeling methods. Uh, I'll explain what that is here in just a moment and some particular types of ensemble models. You see them titled right here, random forest, adaptive boosting, gradient boosting, and so on. So before we talk about the particular models, let's talk a little bit about what ensemble methods uh, are. So an ensemble Modeling is a strategy that involves using multiple models at the same time uh, to come up with a better prediction than what a single model would on its own. So uh, if you see this visualization right here with these targets, this really, uh, for me, demonstrates really well what, can I zoom in in VS Code? Oh, I can, okay. Uh, so this really like visualizes for me like basically what's going on with ensemble models. So you might have one model that's uh, highly precise or highly accurate, which is what's represented by this target on the left here. Um, this is kind of an ideal situation, and it's not. Um, uh, this is you know like a ninety percent something accuracy or precision or whatever like this model represents. So that's not probably uh, realistic to expect this level of precision out of a single model um, uh, potentially if you had big enough data and a robust robust enough pre-processing and hyperparameter tuning workflow but nonetheless um, ensemble models generally tend to perform better than uh, single models on their own like almost across the board especially like in the competition sort of scene so what a uh, ensemble method utilizes is the idea of the wisdom of the crowd uh, and where this concept the wisdom of the crowd came from was some professor at some school way back when he had a bunch of students guess how many jelly beans are in this jar that he put in front of the class and what he ended up finding was when he averaged the predictions of all the students that number the average of all the predictions was actually closer to the true number than all but one of the students' individual predictions were. Um, so ensemble methods kind of in that vein uses multiple models to make multiple predictions and it sort of uh, uses the aggregation of all those predictions to make the prediction of the ensemble model. So you can imagine that if we took all these data points here and this target on the left and we sort of averaged them, they would converge uh, into a distribution very similar to what you see in this one I said on the left the one on the right it would converge if we average it to a very similar distribution of what we see in this one on the left um, so you might have a model that makes like these predictions and you might have another model that makes these predictions and these and so on uh, but then if you average the predictions of all those models they'll all uh, sort of um, regress towards the mean right so that's uh, kind of what's going on with ensemble modeling 
The disadvantage is that it's very computationally computationally expensive uh, between training your models and validating your models and uh, storing those models, those objects uh, in memory on your computer and all that. It uh, takes a lot because you're not dealing with just one model at a time anymore. You're dealing with multiple models at the same time. So uh, this isn't going to work if you're using like a Raspberry Pi for your daily computer probably. Um, going on oh yeah let's talk about bagging real quick before we get into the specifics so there's all sorts of different ensemble models just like there's all sorts of different models um, they all sort of have their own advantages and disadvantages they, they all basically uh, use utilize the same basic idea of bagging which is an acronym or if you will or a conjunction for the, this phrase bootstrap aggregation so what bootstrap aggregation means is you're first bootstrap sampling data which means you're sampling some amount of the data with replacement so if I have 100 data points and I sample 50 of them I'm putting those same 50 back so there's still 100 data points to sample from the next time I sample uh, that's all bootstrap sampling really means uh, at least for the sake of uh, this discussion and the aggregation part is where we take the uh, we aggregate the predictions of all the models that so every model is given like a bootstrap sample and it makes predictions based off that bootstrap sample and then we aggregate the predictions of each of those models so there an aggregation could be a lot of different things like some models use a voting system so it's just like you have 10 models and seven of them vote one way and three the other you're going to go with the prediction that the first seven made um you might take the uh mathematical average like to the mean in other words you might take the um, I was gonna say the mode but that would just be like the voting system if you took the most common occurrence um, what's the third one uh, your median you might take like the median of all the predictions. So there's different ways of calculating aggregating whatever that aggregation is but the idea is that you're taking some subsample uh, for each model you're replacing that subsample so some observations are going to occur in multiple models um, and then you're aggregating the predictions made off of each of those subsamples. Basically all ensemble models use bagging in some way, shape, or form. So there's a few different, like I said, types of ensemble models. Um, first we're going to talk about random forests. And a few episodes back I talked about um, decision trees and regression trees. So um, if any of this isn't quite following, maybe go back and check out that video. That was module, uh, it was 25, 26, 27, 28, somewhere around there. Um, it'll say in the, uh, in the title, like decision trees or something along those lines. Uh, matter of fact, I might link it in the description below if I remember to do that. Um, so what a random forest basically is, is it's a ensemble, a group of decision trees, right? Um, but the problem is that tree-based models are completely deterministic, meaning that if you give the same tree with the same hyperparameters the same data, or if, sorry, if you have two different trees with the same hyperparameters, the same data, they'll both become the exact same tree. There will be no difference between those two models. Um, they'll, for all intents and purposes, be the same model. Uh, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of ensembling models, right? Because the point is that we want, uh, we in fact want some variance between our models within our ensemble. So uh, we do this, partially this is accomplished by using bagging. Uh, so for our random forest, our, we bootstrap sample our, our rows from our data set for each, for each individual tree. Um, and so you, we'll, we'll sample two thirds of the available data for a given tree, and then we'll use the remaining third as your validation set. You're basically doing a, train, a 66, 33 train test split um, on your data, but you're replacing like the training set, right? Uh, and you calculate your out of bag error, which is your, your error term um, for that particular tree. So then to create further variability, because you can imagine uh, if you had enough trees in your ensemble, they might get the same samples or similar enough samples. 
Um, so, and it's important to note we're sampling like that two thirds. We're not sampling like in order, like the the two thirds. We're it's you're taking randomly the amount of two thirds like from from it, right? So that helps create a little bit of variance as well. And we also we sample the subspace within each tree, which basically just means that we're randomly selecting uh, features or columns like from that data. So we'll get ten different trees and we'll do our boot. Or, or, uh, or we'll bag each tree and then once each tree has its bagged data then we go back and we randomly select like which columns we're going to leave it for that tree and which columns we're going to drop from the data in that tree so every tree it's almost guaranteed is going to be different in some way in terms of the data being passed into it all right um, and depending on at least all the random forests I did in this module, this might be different. Um, but all the random forests that I built in this module, they all the tr trees within the random forest use the same hyperparameters. I can see a, like that maybe you would build a random forest where you have different hyperparameters for various trees in the forest, but I didn't do that in this module. So maybe that's a really bad idea. I don't know, um, but uh, something to maybe look into if you're curious. But at least for the sake of this module, all the random forests I did, all the decision trees within the random forest that I built had the same hyperparameters. So the same, they use the same minimum leaf split or max depth or like whatever. Um, so this rigorous bagging and subspace sampling workflow basically makes the random forest model extremely resilient to overfitting because like no single tree in the model has all the data available so it's basically impossible to overfit data that you don't actually have right um, but again that comes at the cost of computational complexity it takes a lot of RAM to build the the model in the first place and then you have to sort of keep that RAM occupied as long as that model is existing on your computer and you're using it until of course you maybe if you decide it's a good model and you want to use it again in the future or you want to deploy it uh, you can pickle that model and deploy it and if you're wondering what pickling is you can go and look at uh, the the very uh, previous video from this one is where we talk about uh, pickle files and stuff like that so that's a random forest basically it's just a collection of decision trees and they're all given like a random uh, randomly sampled subset of the data of the data it all comes from the same data source of course and then you aggregate the predictions of each of those trees and then that spits out your uh, best possible prediction in theory so let's talk about talk about talk about boosting algorithms so uh, just like ensemble methods, there's a whole family of types of models. Within that, you have boosting algorithms, which is a whole sort of like family of models within ensemble methods. Um, they're similarly effective to random forest, but they have some notable differences in terms of like exactly how they work and like what's going on um, under the hood. So one thing is that they, they build models iteratively so how one model is built so so in a random forest say you have 10 different decision trees all those trees are being built uh like in parallel at the same time um and the way what happens in one tree is not affected at all by what happens in the other tree the only thing that's affecting what happens in that tree is uh, exactly which data is sampled and passed into that tree right so versus with boosting algorithms uh that's not necessarily the case like exactly like which subset of the data is sampled and passed into like the current model might affect how the next model is built and they're they're uh the models are built in line they're built sort of one at a time rather than in parallel the same way uh, or the way like they are in random forests um the other thing is that boosting algorithms utilize weak learners so in a random forest every tree that you build is like even on its own like a pretty good decision tree right and you're building uh your the algorithm wants to make that even that individual tree as strong of a learner as good of a model on its own as it possibly can 
right? Um, and the idea is you have a confluence of really strong learners, and then you're going to have like a super strong learner, like in the as the ensemble. Um, boosting algorithms, however, use weak learners, and so like you're building like when one model is being built, it might be generally really bad. However, it's really good at uh, capturing like one particular aspect of the data. All right. Um, so and that's why that's part of um, where like the iteration comes from is you so then you iterate and you have like this these this ensemble set of models and each one of them like doesn't generalize like very well but it, it sort of overfits to like one particular like dimension or aspect of the data um, and so then like as an ensemble all of those models together generalize extremely well um, because you're sort of taking the best aspects of each of these weak learners. So um, boosters aggregate differently. So random forest, they use a voting system where you basically would take the mode. So you, you would have 10 different trees and they'd all give you some prediction and you would take the mode of that set of predictions, right? So the most common um, value that's predicted, right? Or whichever the, the, major the majority rules with random forest, right? Uh, versus boosting algorithms use a they weight the um, importance of the predictions of each so you have 10 different models in your boosting algorithm um, and different models within the out within the ensemble are weighted to be more or less important than others uh, and there's different types of boosting algorithms and so there's different ways that that uh, weighting, weighting system is like calculated, right? But nonetheless, all boosting algorithms, you use this weighting system uh, in some way. Um, so they're not really like, it's not like you have these different models voting on it so much as you're, you have these different models contributing to some prediction at varying degrees or to like, yeah, at varying degrees, right? Do, do, do. So uh, the two types of gradient boosts, or gradient boosting, the two types of boosting algorithms that I went over in this module is Adaboost and gradient boosting. So first we'll talk about Adaboost. Um, so uh, Adaboost is just short for adaptive boosting. This was the first boosting algorithm that was invented and basically um, it builds a model and then when it validates that model, this is what this visualization is for, um, then it looks at which observations were uh, misclassified and then those observations that were misclassified are weighted more heavily in the next model. So you can see like we have this uh, model one here and we go to uh, box two and these plus signs that were misclassified, they should have been captured in the blue area, but they weren't. They get weighted heavier in this next one. And so they end up getting properly classified. But now these negatives were misclassified. So then you, know, you can see they're bigger and they're weighted more heavily in the next one. And then when we aggregate the, these various models with their various weights for the various data points, we get a pretty good capture of, or prediction of the uh, the observations so you can see in this in box four there's really only one data point that was misclassified uh, versus the rest of them like a majority of the data is misclassified but as you can see like in aggregate uh, it's pretty good so um, this is a quote from the curriculum I thought it was just nice adaptive uh, adaboost creates new classifiers by continually influencing the distribution of the data sampled to train each successive learner. So they uh, affect the, the distribution by uh, assigning new weights to uh, various uh, parts of the data. And in addition to Adaboost, we have gradient boosting, which is a little bit more complex than Adaboost. Uh, so it's similar to Adaboost, but the difference is that after validating a model and uh, gradient boosting also uses weak learners, uh, instead of just weighting the misclassified data observations more heavily, it actually calculates the residual 
of the misclassification. So um, I'm going to use a little bit of uh, language here with like residuals and error terms and stuff like that. If you're curious about all that, I want to spend a whole lot of time here. Um, go scroll back earlier on into this phase and um, or maybe even go look at some of the live streams of my phase two project um, and you'll learn a little bit about residuals and that sort of stuff there. But basically a residual is the difference, literally like the distance, the difference between like the actual data point and the predicted data point. Um, so it calculates the residuals of the misclassifications and then that is passed into a loss function, which is just like a fancy calculus formula, basically. Uh, and then you calculate the overall loss of the, the loss, where'd it go? Uh, the overall loss of the model. And then the overall, and then you can use the loss uh, of the model to calculate the gradient, which again, that was went over pretty heavily. And I want to say module 23, 24, something like that. Look up there. There's a whole video I did. There was a whole module over gradient descent and that's uh, all there. So by calculating the residuals, we can calculate the loss and then which we can calculate the gradient with, and then we can pass in the overall loss value uh, and the gradient uh, as predictors when building the next model. So remember, boosting algorithms are iterative. They build one model and then the next. So we use basically the degree of error in one model as a way to, uh, we pass that information in basically as a predictor into the next model. And then that next model as it's being built kind of takes that error into consideration and it that helps make a better prediction with this with each successive model um, and this visualization isn't doesn't make things as clear as the adaboost uh, one did but especially if you're not familiar with uh, regression and gradient descent and all that um, but this is the visualization they provided for uh, gradient boosting and so you can see that like look at like this little shape here um, you can see that these data points are sort of getting compressed uh, with each successive uh, tree model that's used. Um, and also there was like a whole lab done on this thing called XG boost, which just means it's short for extreme gradient boosting. Um, all XG boost is, is it's its own library completely separate from itself. It has implementations available in Python, C++ and a few other languages. Um, but it is a uh, gradient boosting algorithm. It's a whole package, a whole library that's uh, made like specifically for this one, like particularly good uh, gradient boost algorithm. And it's apparently become like kind of a meme that uh, a lot of competitions on like Kaggle are one using XG boost as opposed to any other kind of like ensemble method. So that's supposed to be like the best ensemble um, or, or boosting ensemble algorithm out there right now. I do know the curriculum that I'm using for Flatiron is my cohort leader told me the other day it's like about two years old, which kind of makes sense because that's like about when COVID started. So I imagine they probably didn't, um, you know, production across all businesses was not, uh, was slowed down a little bit through quarantine. And so um, that makes sense to me. But um, yeah, uh, long story short, XG Boost is supposed to be the kind of premier or preferred boosting algorithm gradient boosting algorithm out there again it's not just a boosting algorithm because add boost is different but it's um a gradient boosting algorithm there's gradient boosting uh gradient boost model objects available in scikit learn xg boost uh, like i said is its own library um and you have to so you have to install it separately and you can't pip install it you have to conda install it um but it's fortunately the api for it is written to resemble like almost identically scikit-learn. So the way you import it and instantiate objects and uh, fit data to it and like all that stuff is, is the syntax is basically identical to scikit-learn. Uh, the only difference being that you have to just import it separately than from scikit-learn. Uh, 
yeah, so XG boost is cool. So that is it for today. We talked about gradient boosting. We talked about add a boost, uh, which is all different uh, tools available within the family of boosting algorithms. We talked a little bit about random forests, which are their own sort of ensemble method. And we talked a little bit about just what ensemble methods are in general. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this video or got something out of it or learned something. Um, again, if you're interested in Flatiron and curious about what it has to offer you, I will have that link available down below. You can also just Google Flatiron School pretty easily. Uh, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, ask me any questions directly or just connect and engage, uh, I'd be happy to. LinkedIn link will be in the description below as well as if you'd like to explore this notebook or any of my other repositories on my GitHub, I'll have my GitHub link down below there as well. Um, Yep. So with that, that is going to be, folks, the last study vlog for this phase. Um, and I have some ideas about maybe a little bit different way of doing my study vlog for the next phase, but I'm going to keep that for a surprise later. I will, however, continue to do some videos, um, some vlogging within this phase, but it's going to be from here on out over the mile, me building and working on my milestone project, not on necessarily like learning new stuff. Now I've like learned all this stuff in this phase and now it's time to put it all into practice and like really kind of concretize it in my mind by using it, right? Um, and I have another couple like projects on my mind that I think are just really fun and they're this type of stuff like model modeling and that sort of thing. Um, so that might be coming up in the near future too. It kind of depends on how deep in the weeds I get with the milestone project for the phase. Um, so yeah, like I said, hope you enjoyed it. Check out those links down below and I will see you next time.